medical professionals in the treatment field deal with vicarious trauma and prevent compassion fatigue. And John Coppola from New York's ASAP discusses the association's works and policies. The New York State Association of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Providers is an organization that is dedicated to advocacy and public education. Uh, we uh, represent the interests of alcoholism and substance abuse and problem gambling treatment prevention and recovery programs across the state. And we revisit the segment on socializing in recovery. Hello, I'm Art Flesher from Suffolk County Health Department's Division of Community Mental Hygiene. I'm your host for Something of Substance, a monthly video magazine. Welcome back. Each month, we show how substance abuse, mental illness, and developmental delays affect you, your kids, and your community. We'll also give you a few examples of how services in Suffolk County help people find the inner resources they need to tackle their problems. Where's mom? Did she forget me? I wonder what happened to her. What if I get left here? Drugs and alcohol may make you forget your problems for a moment, but that's not all you forget. My mother worked hard to be in recovery, and I love her for that. The annual Bridging the Gap Conference brings together professionals in the treatment and enforcement fields for training and education. The conference this year looked at the very important subject of vicarious trauma and compassion fatigue with service providers. Bridging the Gap began approximately 15 years ago. It was an idea that was born out of another statewide committee and it was taken to heart by certain members of the, um, of the Suffolk County community in treatment and in the criminal justice system. Well, with all the changes that are going on in the healthcare field and in the field of addictions in general, um, there was a real need to take care of the staff. And that's why we were so happy to uh, be able to have a conference on vicarious trauma, which is really about how the staff deals with hearing the stories that the clients tell them and how they take care of themselves. Well, if we don't recognize that we're all affected by trauma, we really can't help people recognize how they're affected. And, and that was the message I got. It's real important. The question is asked, why trauma? Why are we working on trauma? Why are we focusing on trauma? Much of the literature today about criminality and also about addiction reflects back that early trauma in life and compounded trauma in life leads to maladaptive responses to how we live. Last year's conference was on trauma itself. This year our conference is on vicarious trauma. And vicarious trauma meaning the trauma that is experienced by the workers being exposed to the trauma of the clients and how their own history of trauma may participate in that to compound the stressors that are around that. I'm here today because I work at Suffolk County Methadone and 99.9% .9 of my clients have very significant trauma histories and as I care for them, um, I wanted to learn how to care for myself. Uh, I got a lot of information regarding the trauma and how it affects individuals. I also learned a lot about how it affects myself and what I need to do to help release and get in touch with the my own feelings and be able to help my clients. One of our breakouts is Lillian Drago speaking about transference and countertransference. The experience of working with a traumatized client can become traumatic in and of itself. It's as though the clinician is witnessing the trauma uh, that the client has experienced just by being engaged in uh, a counseling process with that client. As the client struggles and divulges uh, details about their traumatic experience, a good clinician who's really empathic, and that's you know one of the characteristics that makes uh, a clinician effective, is to be empathy and be able to you, see the world through the client's eyes. Uh, that very attribute actually makes the clinician uh, more susceptible to the hazard of something we call secondary traumatization, which is um, that they can start to experience some of the symptoms that people have when they experience trauma 
firsthand themselves, uh, the symptoms of PTSD. Secondary trauma um, affects all of us, and that's why we need the self-care. And That's what some of us professionals, including myself, can forget from time to time. Um, if you are dealing with, for instance, child abuse, and you're seeing client after client after client, you can't help but get affected by it. If you don't deal with it, you can become numb to it. If you become numb to it, then the question is, how are you going to help? Alice E. Augustini is preeminent in looking at alternatives in healing processes. This can mean acupuncture, this can be meditation, this can be any sort other than traditional Western medicine. So compassion fatigue, um, in my area of expertise, I um, work with domestic violence and abuse specifically and trauma. So I have many people who have been sexually abused, there's domestic violence, partner abuse. And so I take this in all day long. I do work a lot of hours. <laughs> That's why I'm taking this program. And so I listen to them and there's a certain amount of stress you're feeling. You feel anger at the abusive person. You feel um, impatient sometimes that the person you're speaking with isn't grasping everything that you're saying in order to help them. And so it's, you do get burned out and you sometimes actually feel ill, you know, um, from hearing this all the time. So uh, with my area of expertise, vicarious trauma, compassion fatigue, burnout, it happens all the time. Beth Moran is a registered nurse who is speaking on the central nervous system and how it functions. The more that we know theoretically about how the brain works and what parts are engaged in it, then we can come to greater understanding of why we function as we do. As a nurse practitioner uh, dealing with holistic medicine, I look at the whole person. And one of the things that I like to look at really is the mind-body connection which is what I'm going to be speaking about today in my breakout session because I really believe that the mind-body connection which has been studied by Candace Pert at the NIH is the basis of most illness and it has to do with the adrenal glands, it has to do with stress, it has to do with hidden traumas that we hold in our body and so what we're going to talk about in my workshop is is the scientific research behind the mind-body connection and then the different modalities that are available to heal people from trauma that they're lodging in their body. Bonnie E. Owens speaks on a very contemporary subject about apps for our phones and our iPads because there is so much resource material out there that helps us in our everyday manner quickly and efficiently accessing new information. As a, a psychotherapist, I use a lot of um, apps on my iPhone and iPad to help people right in the session re-regulate their body. I uh, use the working definition of trauma as when your biology is assaulted in such a way it can't re-regulate itself. So I like to mention and notice that there's no word of psychology in there. So it's a biological assault. So talk therapy alone is not the ideal way to treat their uh, trauma. So these apps include um, breathing, yoga, um, guided meditation, you know, physical exercise, um, journaling. So these are things that clients learn in the session with me and then they get to take it away. And what I love about it is I do a lot of work with first responders um, and so they're not very verbal about being in therapy among their other people. So, you know, they have the anonymity of, of the phone 24-7, I mean, and everybody's on their phone today. So, you know, somebody could be on Facebook, and my client might be doing a guided meditation, but nobody's going to notice. Our hope for the attendees, which are both from the criminal justice system and from the addiction and mental health systems, are that they leave here more informed about trauma, more informed about vicarious trauma as to what it is, but also how it specifically impacts on their work, on their personal lives, and how they can take steps to address that impact and minimize it so that they live more comfortably and function more comfortably in their workplaces. We'd like to thank the Suffolk County Criminal Justice Addiction Work Group for bringing light to this important issue. For more information, please call us at area code 631 
853-8500. Up next, we have an informative discussion with John Coppola from the New York Association of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Providers. We'll be right back. They'll be fine, I hope. What if you could prevent a young person from getting hurt or killed? What should I do? If you could turn back the clock and stop an underage drinking party from ever happening, now you can. Pick up the phone and call 1-866-UNDER-21. It's your community, your call, and it's completely anonymous. John Coppola is the executive director of the New York Association of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Providers. He joins us to discuss the advocacy and policy works of his organization. John, can you explain the mission of your organization? The New York State Association of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Providers is an organization that is dedicated to advocacy and public education. Uh, we uh, represent the interests of alcoholism and substance abuse and problem gambling treatment, prevention, and recovery programs across the state. Uh, we do a lot of uh, professional development work and we do advocacy uh, for funding and regulatory issues in Albany and in Washington. John, can you speak a bit about the various programs the association represents? Yes, um, we represent probably about 220 programs across New York State. Uh, the prevention programs specifically are usually either in uh, school districts uh, so school-based prevention and early intervention services. A lot of those uh, programs uh, work with children as young as kindergarten all the way through uh, grade 12 with educational uh, programs. Also there's a number of uh, student assistance and counseling programs that are considered prevention, uh, working with kids that are high risk and trying to prevent them from using um, alcohol or other drugs. Uh, we also represent the treatment field, and we have uh, outpatient treatment programs, residential, inpatient, uh, pharmacotherapy programs like methadone or, or buprenorphine or, or Vivitrol, where, where people use medications to help uh, people with addictions. Uh, we also have uh, a number of, of uh, halfway houses and uh, sober living uh, type houses that, that have um, uh, agencies, and, and they belong to our association as well. Can you elaborate on the association's action and advocacy policy? So, so one of the most important things that we do is, is advocacy work. And uh, in, in doing that, it's our responsibility really to get a pulse uh, from communities across New York State and what are the issues related to alcohol and other drugs that are of concern. Uh, we generally, every year, conduct a, a policy retreat where we bring representatives from across the state we find out what are the most important and pressing issues, what are your opinions about those issues, and what is it that you think the New York State Legislature should do to try to help fix those issues. Uh, what is it the state government should be doing, or what, what is it that should be happening at the national level. And then what we try to do is to take those positions and put them into position papers that are very on very specific issues. For instance, uh, there might be a position paper on prevention and how, what, what is it that we need to do to, to strengthen prevention. There might be a, a, a position paper on, on insurance and, and how should the insurance industry be covering services. So our responsibility really is to try to understand the positions of people in communities throughout New York State and then to go to our state legislature and to our congressional delegation to articulate those positions and to try to get uh, our lawmakers to enact laws that will help and support uh, substance use disorder prevention, treatment and recovery and also a problem gambling services. Why do you think prevention is important? The prevention is, is important because it, it, it is on some level the, uh, the, the kind of activity that sets the tone for everything, for everything really. So if we think about you know, trying to be healthy, uh, trying to make healthy choices, I mean all of us are gonna do something that's unhealthy in our lifetimes. All of us ha are, are going to you know, sometimes do things that are counterproductive. But if we can build a base, a, a solid base, upon which we're making our decisions, and again, knowing that we're not always gonna make the right decisions, but at least putting us in the best possible position to make these important decisions. So if we can do work with young children, and frankly, let's even just, let's not just make this about children. How about senior citizens who trust their physicians, right? If we train, if we do some prevention work with senior citizens about 
the transition from being part of a married couple to now being single in their advanced ages and maybe being by themselves, and how to cope with loneliness, how to cope with uh, being by themselves at times, where frequently at, 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 in advanced ages is a time when many people become alcoholic or dependent on their prescription medications. So it's not just about kids. If we can help people who are transitioning into their later years to develop healthy habits, to develop other support systems for themselves as, as their friends are passing away maybe, as, as life is in a very difficult, different place for them than it was before, if we can help give people a skill set that they can adapt to that natural transition in their own lives in a healthy way, it really puts them in the best possible position to be healthy and to succeed. And you can apply the same thing to any other stage of life, whether it's little kids or people in their middle years, middle age crises, whatever it is, if we can understand a little bit more about the human condition and understand it really have a positive uh, foundation uh, where we're, we're talking about what are our assets and w what are the things that we can rely on to make healthy decisions, I think that really puts us in a much better place so that when we do uh, periodically veer off the track and maybe get into addiction, uh, there's fewer people who make those unhealthy choices and maybe even they have the ability to be more resilient more quickly and get into recovery when they need to. John, do you have any recommendations on how to best prevent our youth from experimenting with drugs and alcohol? Well, the one thing I guess that, that we, we can do with our, with our kids is that from a very young age is to help them to understand that medication is something to be respected, it's something that has a, a, a proper place, and not unlike uh, you know any example we would set about smoking or drinking or any other kind of drug use is to really to try to set as positive an example for our children as we possibly can. Uh, we should have community norms and regulations that support like healthy uh, drinking, healthy uh, use of, of, of drugs in terms of you know, medications, etc. So I think a lot of it has to do with you know the simple basic common sense uh, kind of approaches. And then frankly I think that, you know the real challenge for us I think more broadly is to address some of the advertising and some of the ways that we incorporate uh, substance uh, uh, use disorders and or alcohol, tobacco into some of the very everyday ordinary circumstances. You know, so we have certain neighborhoods where we've got a, you know, a lot of liquor stores or, you know, just to be thoughtful about, you know, where we place these stores and, and how we, uh, you know, and, and it's not to say that there's anything wrong with having a, a liquor store in a neighborhood. But just to just be thoughtful about it, what kind of advertising we're doing, uh, you know, and to be as responsible as we possibly can is probably the single biggest thing that we could do and making sure that, you know, our laws and our, and our, and our, just our norms and our culture are sort of respectful of these things, which all, you know, have some good. There's something good uh, in all of it. And that we just not, uh, you know, create a situation where we become dependent, addicted, et cetera, and, and bad things happen, unhealthy things happen. Thanks for joining us, John. Art, thank you very much for this opportunity, and, and uh, thank you for your good work. We'd like to thank Mr. Coppola for this discussion, and the New York Association of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Providers for their ongoing efforts. Up next, we revisit the archive segment on socializing and recovery. Stay tuned. For many individuals living in recovery, the triggers of relapse are often embedded within social environments. Finding places of sobriety that support living a healthy lifestyle, free from drugs and alcohol, is often a challenge for those struggling with the disease of addiction. In our archive segment this month, we revisit the subject at the Town of Babylon's Division of Alcohol and Substance Abuse Services. The Town of Babylon Division of Substance Abuse Services is a program that's dedicated to helping our patients recover from the disease of chemical dependency in a safe environment, uh, in a place where they can feel safe and be able to achieve their recovery and be, go on to uh, become productive uh, citizens. When I first came out of treatment, it was fear of the outside, what would lie ahead and, and what I was able to uh, accomplish. For me, in early sobriety, I uh, you know, had to be careful of people, places, and things. Um, that's what I was told to beware of. Um, I couldn't, you know, be with uh, maybe people that would be a trigger for me or situations where I used to, you know, drink or do drugs. Well, the consequences of early recovery for me really was 
finding a place of comfort because drugs and alcohol are everywhere. I had a 10 year addiction. So the triggers were in the streets, they were on the placards, they were in the stores. When you, when you come into a situation where there's um, alcohol, a uh, good thing is to take yourself away from it, okay? Walk away from it, uh, call a sponsor, utilize your group, utilize your peer support. I had to just be mindful of my situations. I had to be mindful of the choices that I made and the places that I went and the people that I, you know, would associate with. You know, when I woke up from that alcoholic fog, and I realized that the people that I was associating with uh, were doing exactly the same thing I was doing. I realized that those associations and those relationships were really um, centered around the drug. Now that that was no longer going to be part of my life, I had to learn how that social process was going to happen without a drink or a drug. Run through your head, what will happen if I decide to pick up and drink? It's not usually that you're going to drink one and it's going to be okay. Most of us don't have that, um, that, that type of luck. We pick up one and we're off to the races and that's the old saying. Somebody can say, I can have a drink and I'm okay. That's you. But for the, the, you know, the alcoholic and the drug addict, that one can run 10 years. Human beings are social animals. And one of the things that was important for me in my recovery was getting away from those individuals that I associated with as an active alcoholic and starting a whole new social life for myself, starting a whole new um, group of associations that was not alcohol or drug centered. Um, and in early recovery I was, you know, blessed to have a group of friends who we all kind of just got together, you know, after meetings, we would go to the diner, we would do things together just sober type of activities. What really helped me the most was that I had to have people that I could identify with. Sometimes family, they can't deal with it because they only remember you with how you were. But going through some type of an addiction, you're not the same. You know, you may look the same to them, but you, you're not the same. So you really have to tap into people who can identify with where you're at and where you want to go. So having a sponsor is great because there are triggers, man. I'm telling you, this culture is set up, you know, for uh, relapse. So it's important to be part of a community support group um, in terms of getting sober and having a life in recovery because just of the board support, that we need the support of each other. Uh, and the support is crucial to maintaining sobriety throughout the rest of your life. The one advice I would give anybody that's coming into this, this lifestyle is that all of us have gone through the same thing. The first thing we all go through, we deny that we have the problem. That's the first thing. So that's common no matter what gender, what, what your ethnicity is, you know. So the thing is, figure this out early. you got to start becoming honest. So with the help of a phone call, the help of um, a support group that's there every day, seven days a week, 24 hours, morning, night. See, community programs are really important because what they do, they touch base with the person one-on-one, -on -one, they talk, they're honest, you can be open, and if you don't want to be open, at least you're in a group setting where you can at least listen to people that have gone through it. So you get an idea, you draw from the ideas because there's no such thing as good or bad. People think, oh, well, it's not for me. Well, if you're in the room, it is for you because you're going to learn something. So those programs, whether it's AA, NA, or whether it's just outpatient programs, they help you to at least focus and you're going to hear something that's going to really touch where you're at in your recovery. Well, one of the things that we, we find with people in early recovery, especially when they have become newly detoxified from their chemical of choice, is they start to wake up and they say, my gosh, look at all of the things I've been missing. I'm feeling good, I'm feeling great, I'm, 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 I'm seeing what recovery can be, and now suddenly, I, instead of being a day or two or a month or a couple of weeks in recovery, I want to be a year into recovery, trying to rush the process. Honesty is the worst, the worst enemy to your disease. The more you hide, the more you try to shelter, the disease keeps growing and expanding, and before you know it, you'll end up in prison like I did. 
and your life would be out of control, family's out of control. But I'm saying to you, I got 10 years clean, and I got my family back, I got my life back, I have a music career, I'm doing very well because I had to start being honest. Now, September is National Recovery Month, and it is part of our celebration of recovery from chemical dependencies. And what we did last year was we put on this party, we had close to 300 people there. And we had a DJ, and we had dancing, and we had a big free Italian buffet, all, all supplied by donations from the community. And it was amazing to see this 275 people in this one facility having a great time dancing, eating, and listening to a lot of great music, and there was not one drop of alcohol and or one drug in the whole place. And most of these people who were there were, were, were uh, recovering folks, but we also want, want you to know that it's open to anybody who was in support of recovery or was part of the recovery community. Programs like Rock and Recovery, and also we're doing something with Gospel Health Fair, these are programs that allow the individual who's in recovery to identify with people that are like him or her. It's so important that you can go to a place where you can say, you know what, that guy over there, I don't know him, but we share something in common. So that is a support. It gives you strength, it helps you just to relax, and plus, it's a sober environment. So you can't get better than that, and you're getting entertainment. So I advise anybody, if you get an opportunity, to attend a Rock and Recovery uh, event. We'd like to thank the Town of Babylon's Division of Alcohol and Substance Abuse Services for hosting this discussion. If you'd like to learn more about the services they offer, you can contact them at area code 631-789-3700. We'd like to thank our viewers for tuning in to Something of Substance. Our video magazine is a public resource and we're eager to hear your feedback, as well as any suggestions you may have for future show topics. For all inquiries and concerns, please contact me at art.flesher at suffolkcountyny.gov. I'm your host, Art Flesher. Join us again next month for more of Something of Substance.